Hello, everyone. It's great to be here today. My name is Karen Kerrigan, President and CEO of the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council. Uh, my organization, SBE Council, is also a very, very proud member of the Small Business Roundtable. It's an honor to be here to be a part of this conversation on a topic that is vital to the growth of small business and entrepreneurship globally. And taking Dana's story as just one example, it's clear that digitization is a game changer for today's small businesses, especially in light of the pandemic. At Small Business Roundtable, we continue to see how the acceleration of digitization and changes in customer demand behavior make the difference for small businesses. In fact, a survey conducted by Facebook and Small Business Roundtable found that in light of the pandemic, 51% of small businesses reported increasing online interactions with clients and their customers, while 36% of personal businesses that use online tools indicated that they were conducting all their sales online in response to the crisis. Small businesses that utilize digital tools intensively and leveraged online sales using payment, delivery, social, and productivity tools were less likely to experience economic hardships and were better prepared to weather financial strains. This digital safety net has acted as a lifeline for small businesses, empowering them to continue operating, to quickly respond to new opportunities in the marketplace and globally, and more effectively evolve with the new normal, more so than less digitally savvy small businesses. Governments are also taking action to support SMEs to go digital. This year, the UK announced that it would enact a help to grow digital scheme aimed at boosting productivity and innovation in SMEs across the whole of the UK. In today's environment, digital is a must for small and medium enterprises and their success also depends on government's ability to keep pace with and support digital innovation in small business operations. And that is why I'm so excited uh, to be able to moderate this panel today to have a cross section of small business policy industry, trade experts and government leaders joining today's conversation on our panel, trend setting in entrepreneurship, how digital made the difference. So let me introduce all these fantastic panel members. Uh, first, we have Liz Barclay, Commissioner Barclay, the UK Small Business Commissioner. In July, she was appointed to the role to spearhead the national effort to crack down on poor payment practices, which cause thousands of small businesses to close every year. Liz is the first female Small Business Commissioner, a post created in 2016 to help small businesses secure the payments owed to them and to galvanize UK businesses behind a new culture of prompt and fair payment. Uh, next, we have Ramiro Cavazos, President and Chief Executive Officer of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and a very, very active member of the Small Business Roundtable. The US Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is an organization that actively promotes the economic growth, development and interests of more than 4.7 million Hispanic owned businesses that combined contribute over 800 billion to the American economy every year. Uh, next, we have Dr. Barbara Kachwar. Uh, she is executive director of the Visa Economic Empowerment Institute where she leads a team of fellows and sets the research agenda to advance the international exchange of policy ideas on fostering digital equity and inclusion, unlocking growth through trade, and imagining an opening future for payments. And finally, our, our panel would not be complete without Caitlin, Caitlin Wilkins, a Vice President of Global Small Business Sales at Facebook. She and her team help millions of small businesses advertise uh, worldwide uh, to connect with their customers and grow through personalized advertising on Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Messenger. So, uh, Welcome to all of you, and um, I, I look forward to this conversation. And I, I would normally begin with directed questions, and to be sure, and you know that will be coming. Um, but I think the digitization of small business activity 
over the last 18 months has been transformative uh, for small businesses, for our, the, for our economy generally, and we should begin there. So going down the line, um, um, I'd like to ask each of you uh, to respond to this and uh, or, or basically ask each of you to share what you have seen in terms of trends as it relates to businesses going digital. And Liz Barclay, I will begin with you. Thank you, um, and thank you for inviting me. It's a, a real joy to be here and meet everyone. We are finding very similar trends in the UK to those that you've already mentioned. Um, our small businesses, particularly the smallest of the small before the pandemic, were probably about 52% digital, 48% still hadn't adopted and embraced digital. But of course that changed, uh, as you said, during the pandemic. And I think those of us who were working with small businesses were quite surprised at the fact that fewer small businesses went to the wall than we imagined might do so. And I think that was down to that digital adoption in many, many cases. Uh, it just proved how resilient small businesses are because they have the ideas, they're innovative, they're not uh, scared to take the risks. And so at the point that they were faced with possible annihilation, through the pandemic, they went for it. They were nimble, they were agile, they embraced technology, they came up with new business models, they applied new ideas, they found new customers, they found new ways of serving their old previous customers. Um, and we're expecting that to stick. We're expecting that to be the trend of the future. Uh, and I think reports showed and many people said that anecdotally, we did five years of digital adoption in so ever so many weeks, you know, probably around about the first 12 weeks of the pandemic. So it was a really fast adoption. But of course, if the tools hadn't been available and we hadn't been in 4G with 5G coming, then we probably wouldn't have been in that position. So, but we still have a long way to go. And we must not forget that because there are still a lot of small businesses that realize they must go digital. We have got something called making tax digital coming through the system in about two years time. That will mean that everybody has to do their tax reporting digitally. So the smallest of small businesses will find that that's an impetus. They haven't already adopted technology. They've got to do that. So we expect this to carry on for the next several years. Right. Those are excellent observations. And, you know, I guess what we've said in many of our members is that, you know, that was, this has sort of been the silver lining of the pandemic is the discovery of technology and tools and all these innovative um, ways and tools that have allowed small businesses to uh, operate more effectively, efficiently, and to reach out to customers and to uh, find new markets, et cetera. And I know in a survey that we did 85% of small businesses said they would not have been able to survive without all these technology uh, tools and innovations. So Ramiro, I'm gonna turn, turn it over to you next for your observations. Well, what we've seen is the, the data proves out that when you look at the 62 million plus Latinos living in, in the US, uh, you know, this is a population that the median age is 30. Uh, and one out of every five uh, people living in the U.S. are Latino or self-identify as, as Hispanic. Uh, the average age of non-Latino whites uh, is 50. And so this is, these are digital natives. Uh, six out of uh, every 10 millennials living in this country are Hispanic. So this is a vibrant, fast-growing, innovative, uh, population that uh, naturally was already connected to the digital uh, and technology tools uh, that we're living in. And so uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, it was uh, an adjustment that everyone needed to be made because this is a community that also is on the front lines providing health care, direct services, retail, uh, food related, uh, and also tech and low tech businesses. So this is a community that is very positive about the future, post-pandemic, higher percentage than, than other communities. And it's a very uh, diverse community. We are uh, a community that is Afro-Latino, Asian-Latino, Caucasian, uh, white Latino, and, and LGBTQ, and, 
uh, is highly educated and uh, business uh, success is a higher percentage from a failure standpoint than the rest of the population. So we're getting that story out. Uh, we're embracing the future post pandemic because the digital uh, environment by our community is one that is part of the DNA already. That optimism is so great to hear, Ramiro. And um, and I think we all need to hear that given, you know, sort of there's certainly, um, you know, challenges that many small businesses continue, you know, to navigate uh, uh, currently. Um, still some uncertainties. Uh, obviously there's some supply chain issues and things like that. But again, technology has been the solution and the answer across the board to many of these challenges. So. Uh, uh, Dr. Kachwar, we're going to go to you next. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be part of this panel. You know, Visa is very excited to be a member of the Small Business Roundtable, and um, thank you so much for inviting us. We're um, at the Economic Empowerment Institute. We've been studying this as well. We've looked at um, thousands of small businesses across the world, some in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa. Um, our most recent survey was on the United States. And we're really seeing similar trends to, to what you've observed. Um, Karen, you mentioned in the introduction that there's been an unprecedented transition to e-commerce and to digital payments. Um, and we're really seeing this. And I agree with Commissioner Berkeley that many of these changes are likely to stay. And that makes it even more important to think about how to help small businesses, um, not only weather the pandemic, but continue to prosper, um, to work resiliently, and to really adapt the technologies to, to meet their needs. Um, we know that this time has been very difficult for many small entrepreneurs who are navigating the challenges associated with e-commerce, um, particularly those who are not digital natives, um, who face challenges in, for example, the cybersecurity area for the first time for some of them. And I think that, you know, we need to recognize that and take that seriously and think about how both businesses and the public sector sector can help them with those challenges. Now, on the other hand, um, I you know, really share Mr. Cavazos's optimism, and that's reflected in a lot of what we're seeing in talking to these small businesses. The transition presents some really exciting opportunities for these businesses to reach new customers and markets, um, and quite a number of new businesses have started in order to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, picking up on that trend, we've actually seen a growth in the number of new small businesses. This has been really well documented in the United States, where monthly new business applications have seen a historic high over the past 18 months. You've seen this in other parts of the world as well, especially in some countries in Europe and in Latin America. So we have a whole new class of digitally native entrepreneurs who have entered this realm, either out of necessity or opportunity. And we've looking at these firms, um, we've seen a couple of kind of interesting trends. Um, we saw that firms that have been formed in the past year are more likely than firms that started before the pandemic to be headed by women, um, which is interesting. And we saw that in a number of geographies in the United States as well. Um, in the U.S., there also seems to have been a trend in the rise in minority-owned women-led firms, and I suspect that some of the members of Mr. Cavazos' um, chamber um, have, have seen something similar. And another interesting thing we saw with these firms is that, um, you know, digitization and e-commerce makes it kind of levels the playing field for small firms to be able to export. It cuts down the number of procedures that small firms need to take. Um, it's, it's much easier. It expands the market scope. It expands the reach. And we've really seen that. We've seen that these firms, these minority owned firms and these women led firms are starting to export to more markets and they're exporting to more and different markets than traditional firms. Now, we need to do more research to understand the confluence of factors behind these findings. Um, that said, it's, it's exciting to see the spike in innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and 
you know, at Visa, we're interested to see how digital payments can help to make this possible and to help these entrepreneurs really continue to succeed. Um, you know, recognizing that the transition hasn't been easy for all small business owners, I'd argue that on net, they've been positive for individuals, for communities, and for the global economy. And I'm really excited to see the business community, academics, and policymakers working together to continue to digitally enable small businesses and help ensure that they continue to grow and thrive. And I think that this panel is such an important, um, you know, part of that conversation. So thank you so much for, for having us and for holding this and for all of the great work that you do. Dr. Kachra, I am so glad that you brought up, you know, that the whole, um, this whole issue of just the boost in entrepreneurship, you know, that we've seen, that we've seen, I mean, the numbers in 2020 were off the charts compared to 2019 pre-pandemic. So when you do have you know, sort of these cataclysmic events or these type of transformative events in our economy, there's a lot of, lot of individuals that see opportunity out there. And I think that speaks to the resiliency of, you know, the spirit of people, you know, uh, those who want to become entrepreneurs are seeing that opportunity, they're taking it. And they're seeing it in sectors um, uh, like, for example, retail and online retail. So there's lots of, um, they see that there's a lot of competitive opportunity out there. And, uh, Again, that just speaks to the importance of, and I know we're going to get this later, of, of policies and government, you know, supporting a lot of these new entrepreneurs, you know, particularly in this digital space, um, given the closure that we saw of a lot of businesses uh, due to the pandemic. So, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, that is again just sort of another one of those silver linings, you know, of the pandemic. Um, so, Caitlin, we're gonna move to you for your remarks. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, the harsh reality of going last is I think the you w, guys- really, The W. <laughs> yes, you guys have very much covered like so many of the of the uh, big trends that we're seeing globally. So I would echo, you know, first what's been shared here in terms of the speed and permanence, permanence of digital transformation and the way it's helping small businesses. Um, I'll add, I think that while digital is definitely definitely helping to drive the SMB recovery is really that backbone. You know, we're not out of the woods yet. Um, the number of SMBs who say they can continue to operate for the next six or 12 months is steadily ticking upwards, which is such a positive sign. But this holiday period that we're about to come into is absolutely critical for a lot of small businesses survival as this pandemic heads into year two. Um, Karen, the Facebook state of small business report that you mentioned, you know, showed that in the U.S., 17% of SMBs expect to make over 50% of their annual revenues in the final three months of the year. Um, and that number is even higher for diverse owned small businesses. So 34% and 29% of Black and Hispanic led SMB you know, respondents say that they're going to be making half their sales during this holiday time. So you know, digital is the new normal for sure, um, but the continuously changing market conditions around COVID globally, two years on, I think is still really challenging small business fundamentals on cash flow and staffing and stability. So, you know, the education and partnership and, you know, systemic and governmental support is just remains so critical in terms of how we support this newly digital world of SMBs. Well, you know, it sounds like at least in the U.S., we need to start Small Business Saturday much earlier. It begins the, <laughs> every the Saturday, Saturday, Small Business Saturday. Saturday. <laughs> that's yeah. right. And uh, well, that's part of that's what we've done. I think the whole, uh, you know, the, the sort of the support of small and local business generally. What 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 Small Business Saturday has done, um, broadly speaking, in terms of supporting small businesses. Sure. So, Caitlin, I'm going to start with you since you went last. Yeah, <laughs> um, and and you know Facebook plays several roles as it relates to growing digitization, obviously, and uh, indeed, you know we've done uh, some compelling research, the Small Business Roundtable uh, with uh, Facebook that I mentioned earlier. Can you talk about the varied ways from marketplace to advertising to even the rise of the influencer economy? Mm -hmm. um, how Facebook is shaping small business digital growth? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, Facebook got strong signal on this trend very early on because we were able to quickly see, you know, a spike in the number of businesses that were signing up for Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, um, as well as a spike in businesses advertising on the platform. Um, but it wasn't your typical surge. I think um, as we started to cover earlier on, you know, these are small businesses moving from offline to online for the very first time. And we knew we needed to do more to meet folks where they were um, and candidly to do it while pivoting our own 
potent tactics for how we engage small businesses in the online space. Um, and so a big focus for us was, was really just helping businesses get online. You know, there are more than 200 million businesses that use Facebook's free products and services to connect with customers. So to reach and empower them, we did a lot. Um, you know, the first thing is, you know, evolving our Facebook for Business Hub to include resources and turnkey partnerships with e-commerce platforms like Shopify, WooCommerce, and Wix, just to help people make a website for the first time. That's a hugely complicated thing to do. Um, if you are you are a you know single, you're a sole proprietor or working at a very small um, you know small small business. You know, and alternatively, you know, for those who are using our platforms as their digital front door, we invested a lot in terms of improving functionality for our free products. So the ability to quickly update business hours, um, take online reservations, promote curbside pickup, sell gift cards as a new revenue stream, um, and more. And then, you know, we really had to think about how we refreshed trainings. You know, Facebook often started with advertising, and we really backed up the bus you know, with Facebook Blueprint and other resources to teach people how to get and stay online first. Um, and then later think about how do you scale or advertise and, and um, continue to grow and accelerate as a, as a digital small business. Um, I grew up in Michigan, so I'll tell you a quick story about a company based in Detroit um, that went through this transformation. Um, it's called the Lush Yummy Pie Company. Um, and when the pandemic hit, uh, Jennifer Lyle, who was the store's owner, was, was selling primarily through retail. And overnight, you know, she had to figure out how to sell online and shift her entire business model to direct to consumer. <laughs> Um, and so she used Facebook to promote pie drops where customers could come into the bakery at a certain time and pick pies up directly from her. Uh, she kept in touch with customers through Messenger and started to, you know, build, you know, stronger relationships that way. And then also, you know, used ads to appeal to new customers in her area and drive volume for herself. Um, and so thanks to, you know, a lot, a lot of the digitization that we're talking about, businesses like hers, you know, have continued to boom throughout the pandemic. And I think, you know, as, as all have been saying, this is really a permanent diversity in terms of the way that small businesses are, are operating. That's fabulous. And Ramiro, I want to bring you in at this point to, you know, for you to talk about uh, your membership, American Latinx businesses, uh, the impacts that you've seen, these type of impacts in the businesses that you represent and the business owners that you talk to. Well, uh, Karen, thank you again for moderating this great panel. Uh, uh, appreciate everybody's contributions. For for our members, uh, we have five million Hispanic-owned members uh, who are uh, members of their local chamber. We have 260 Hispanic chambers uh, from Honolulu to Puerto Rico and, and all 50 states. Uh, again, fast-growing population. Each of our chambers became uh, an emergency room for small businesses, to connect them to capital, to help them with their paycheck protection program loans, the EIDL, the restaurant uh, re revitalization uh, program. Um, and this, this community was very stoic that I represent. They just did their work. They, they worked uh, in, in their environment and didn't often ask for resources or help. Uh, this is a community that clearly uh, over the years has also been discriminated against when it comes to small business loans. Uh, eight out of 10 applicants in the Latino community applying to a bank were turned down for loans even before the pandemic. So mm -hmm. there were the, this was there was a lot of adversity that had to be overcome. So when the pandemic hit, most people would think, well, this disruption is really going to get in the way. But quite frankly, the pandemic uh, actually rolled out the red carpet for many of our businesses who needed to use digital tools like Facebooks and, and other corporations uh, that were free to make sure that they had the resources that they needed. They went to their local chamber to build that network to find out how to access capital. And so if anything, what we noticed through our chambers, we didn't lose one Hispanic chamber the business uh, closures were temporary and then they were uh, brought back in through small business grants or chamber grants and, and through the federal government also, the Minority Business Development Agency, the Small Business Administration, less than a thousand SBA certified lenders before the pandemic. Now there are more than 5,000 community banks got in the picture, fintechs got into the picture, became top 10 access to capital. The final point is this, if anything, the pandemic that we experienced uh, and are still 
growing out of has cleared the path forward for entrepreneurs to be innovative, to try new things, and to take risks that they would have never taken because the stakes are so high right now, as you all know, when it comes to health and, and also survivability. So entrepreneurs are survivors to begin with. And uh, we have seen that our chambers, uh, all of them around the country, uh, became an uh, economic oasis for their local communities. And so our biggest strength was our network of national Latino chambers to help small businesses, especially Latinos businesses, Latinx businesses, uh, get back on their feet. That's great, Romero. And um, yes, and it's it, fabulous how the chamber, uh, Hispanic chamber responded, you know, to this, this crisis and really, you know, connecting the dots, you know, for your members and really taking advantage of both private sector resources and innovation, but also, you know, the government's big help in this regard too. But it does take a lot, you know, to help small businesses navigate through that. And we'll, we'll get a little bit more to the government's role later in a little bit, uh, Liz, I'm coming to you in one second. But I'm going to ask um, Dr. Akashwar um, a question here, um, or a couple of questions. You know, with an increasing number of SMBs embracing e-commerce and digital payments, can you tell us what challenges and opportunities this rise prevents, uh, presents uh, for small businesses? And what does Visa Economic Empowerment Institute research tell us about how to best support and to enable entrepreneurs and SMBs in this new digital first, which is quickly becoming a digital first uh, global economy. Right, um, thank you. That's that's a great question. And I, I suspect there are lots of you know, thoughts about this. Um, as, as we've talked about on this panel, you know, transitioning to e-commerce and, and digital payments isn't easy, particularly for some, um, for some populations. We you know, have, have heard from several small businesses that have really been able to survive as a result of being able to accept digital payments um, who, who were reluctant to do so before because of age and cultural factors, um, a lack of knowledge, and who had to adopt digital payments in order to survive um, and did so really resiliently and you know are, are now grateful and, and happy that they did so. But it was a big jump. And so when you look at, you know, Ramiro talked about the, the Hispanic millennials in, um, in the United States. Um, we had a small business in Mexico um, who was not a millennial. <laughs> he was quite a bit older. He started a restaurant just a couple of months before the pandemic hit. He wasn't planning to accept digital payments, um, but, you know, Visa helped him do so. And he's very happy he did so, but he did just show some pre trepidation. So, you know, for some groups, it's really a big kind of jump to, to move to this. And one of the things that folks need to, to think about is how to really reach out to these different communities and make sure that different groups are comfortable and have the tools that help them, um, you know, make the best out of out of their situation and really thrive and and survive um there's a wide range of ways that that both the business sector and the public sector and you know the the thought leader sector um can really support smbs um just to highlight two really telling findings from our recent research one we found um that the main really concrete result that we found that held across the world, and we looked at firms in Mexico and Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, South Africa, the US, we're doing similar studies in Dubai and, and soon in the UK, um, is that across the board, small business owners expressed a strong preference for assistance with digitization, even over additional loans or grants. And I think that really speaks to the need to think about how to customize assistance so that 
companies in different sectors and at different levels of digital awareness are able to seamlessly transition. Um, so it's really heartening and I'm looking forward to hearing what Commissioner Barclay is going to speak about in terms of what the UK is planning to do. And it's great to see you know, across the world similar positions being created in this type of assistance being given to small businesses. Um, and I think this, this answer, you really just you know underscores how important e-commerce and digital payments is to those small entrepreneurs. It points also to some really concrete opportunities for, for businesses and for policymakers and academia to try to make an immediate difference. So um, my colleagues on the business side at Visa Inc. are stepping up to help this, um, this important community. Um, Visa pledged last year to digitally enable 50 million small businesses across the globe. Um, I think just a week ago or so, they announced that they've already reached 16 million, so about a third of that goal and are enthusiastically moving forward. Um, we've also revamped and kind of bolstered our small business hub, which gives access to a number of tools, um, similar to what our colleagues at Facebook were talking about, you know, really some of the basics, helping small businesses learn how to set up their websites, you know, how to do business. Um, and what's also really important is sort of the supplementary financial literacy education. We have a program that we call practical money skills and one that we call practical business skills. Um, this is all online. It's all free. And it's just really important to have this sort of contextual, continuous learning um, and tools made available. That's all great. And 50 million, wow, connecting 50 million small businesses to e-payments, e that is just fabulous. A great work by Visa. Liz, I'm, a really simple question for you. How does government um, you know, play a role in this? I mean, I know you've been doing a lot over in the UK, but what is the government's role and how, how do you play a role in this? Well, um, I'm part of the government's role because my office was set up under the Enterprise Act in 2016 and we actually launched in 2017. And our role is to get payments to small businesses as quickly as possible. It's mm. to make sure that small businesses are confident enough and capable enough to say, no, I can't wait four months to get paid for this piece of work that I'm doing now. I need it much quicker than that. It's about persuading bigger businesses that actually their small suppliers can't survive, can't wait for four months to get paid. They need to get those payments more quickly and change that culture so that everybody's working to get those small and micro businesses that we've just been talking about paid as quickly as possible so that they have the certainty. They know when the money is going to come in. That means they can invest. That means they can think about training. It means they can think about recruitment and job creation. And that's hugely, hugely important because it's the small, the micro businesses that are really driving uh, recovery here. And just to pick up on a point that Barbara made earlier, we have about, uh, we think we might even make record one million new small businesses in the UK this year. And that would be uh, the, the biggest number ever. Now, the question, of course, is, are they setting up out of necessity or are they setting up because this is a chance in a lifetime? But actually, most of those people setting up will understand digital tools and digital adoption and will probably come with them because they'll have been coming out of an employment environment where with where bigger businesses have already put that digital adoption in place. So the chances are we're going to see more people coming ready to do business in that way. Um, we've got to be careful, though, because sometimes the infrastructure isn't quite up to it. Uh, somebody, a woman said to me the other day, I run all of my business completely from my smartphone. The only problem is sometimes I have to stand in a field in order to <laughs> You know, so we, we've, got, we've still got ways to go. Um, but we are also, the government is also thinking very much about levelling up. So how do we take some of our, our uh, poorer areas where our local small businesses can really make the difference and think about how we level up the environment so that they can create the jobs, uh, follow their dreams, that, you know, come up with the ideas and the inventions that will take us into... Uh, the next period of growth and recovery. Uh, so there's that levelling up. There's also the building back better. How do we build back better? How do we 
make sure that everybody has access to the tools that we've been talking about, for instance. And that's one of the things that we have done is come up with the Help to Grow scheme. Now, the Help to Grow scheme is about management skills on one hand and digital skills on the other. Uh, and it is thinking about how do we help those businesses that aren't already really business savvy and don't have the management skills to, to get those skills. And how do we help the businesses that need digital software, et cetera, that they haven't been able to afford previously and the skills that they haven't acquired previously? How do we help them to gain those over the next few years and really drive forward on that digital front? So the government is playing a big role. And of course, on the, the payment front, we've already got uh, our open banking and uh, open banking driven uh, tools that we've been putting in place over the last four years in order to make sure that financing is easier, payments are easier, more seamless, quicker, uh, less friction in the system. Uh, so with those measures, I think uh, the government is fairly determined that small businesses, and I think this is probably for the first time that the, the small businesses have really been, uh, seem to be at the heart of this. Yes, we've said they're the lifeblood, but I think there's a growing recognition of that uh, over the pandemic. Well, the, all your work has been fantastic, Liz. Thank you very much. And I know the UK government has been doing a lot to champion small businesses. For example, the transatlantic uh, small business dialogues have been great forms. Um, Ramiro, the, um, the kind of program that Liz describes in the UK, is that something here in the US, we could be building from a, a, a program like that of that model. How would that impact your membership? Well, our, most of our members are small businesses, of course, Karen. And as you, as you, we're honored to be a part of the Small Business Roundtable. More than 30 million businesses in America are small. Um, government is a big economic generator, not just when it comes to regulations or policies or monetary flexibility, uh, setting interest rates, but purchases, procurement. Uh, the U.S. government, for example, is the, is the largest buying service in the world. Uh, we all think about Fortune 1000 firms, and yes, they're huge juggernauts when it comes to purchases, but the fact of the matter is it, less than 7% of the U.S. government's purchases in the trillions and multi-trillions of dollars go to small minority and women-owned businesses. So big business does very well with the US government, but small business does not. And this quick pay uh, program is so important also because our businesses also not only are challenged about you know, getting that contract, uh, but also um, they don't have the, the funds uh, in reserve to last more than 30 days for payment. So we can do a better job in the U.S. government uh, and the private sector to do business with Hispanic-owned businesses and women-owned businesses. After all these businesses, if you look at the data from the Great Recession of 2008, small business was 50% of the reason of how we rebuilt from the recession uh, 12, uh, 13 years ago. The other half of those businesses I know Caitlin mentioned and, and uh, Dr. Kochwar trade was a big part of the rebuilding. And what better uh, business than a Hispanic owned business that like in Europe, uh, as you know, Liz, uh, Latinos speak multiple languages, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and other languages. These are not cultural uh, affinities. These are business tools today in how we interface with the rest of the world when it comes to trade and commerce. And Latin America is a huge marketplace and Europe where it's largely unexplored by US business, especially small business. So I believe a big part of our rebuilding will not just be the government uh, putting out uh, guidelines and policies that are helpful to business, but also making sure that every cabinet secretary has a spend goal. He or she needs to do their part I'm glad to see that our president, uh, Biden, has uh, passed an executive order to put a goal of 15% for purchases with small minority women-owned businesses compared to 5%, which was there before. So there's a lot of work to be done with certification, 
you know, the big, the, the big three for us are access to capital, contracts, and capacity. And so that's our focus at the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And we're proud that our, the chair of our board is a woman and uh, two thirds of our board members are female. And so our decision making is driven by women entrepreneurs and private sector leaders that not only have that intuition of where we need to go, but also have uh, the affinity for making sure that we open up those doors of opportunity. So no question, Karen, we should be doing more and we should be doing better to give small businesses more business. That's part of the rebuilding of our economy. And, and just real quickly, um, Ramiro, in terms of um, the combination of digital marketplaces, digital financial services impacting Hispanic businesses, anything else you know, on that front you know, that you'd like to add? Well, I, I, the only thing I'd like to add is, is uh, that uh, this is an economy that's the seventh largest economy in the world. And so it is driven by digital and, and innovation and technology. There are, uh, as I mentioned, 65 million uh, Hispanic uh, uh, people living in America. Uh, this population has a GDP of $2.6 trillion alone uh, as a population. It is larger than the whole economy of India with 1.3 billion people. So if we don't do business with these digital natives, younger population that's innovative, we're missing a great opportunity to do business with the seventh largest economy in the world if it were its own country. So this and 80 percent of these Americans living here were born and raised here. You know, the narrative out there about immigrant businesses being the only uh, business within the Latino community uh, that does exist. And that's where innovation comes. But uh, it's it's the 80 percent of this population that, like myself, seventh generation Texan, you know, this is an economy that we helped build starting more than 500 years ago. The last point I would make, uh, Karen, is is that the U.S. Uh, symbol, the dollar sign came from the Spanish peseta. Uh, mm. That's why it is S and, and the two bars is one stands for silver and one stands for gold. But the monetary system during the American colonial period came from uh, the Hispanic community, from the, the Spanish who settled uh, a big part of this nation uh, first next to our Native Americans. So the monetary system uh, has been driven by this community and it's time that, that we realize that this is a community that needs to be leveraged and supported through business and resources. Ramiro, I learn something new every day that we're in a room or on a panel together. <laughs> thank you for thank you for all those those, those wonderful comments. Um, I think the conversation and certainly some of the things that Ramiro touched upon uh, they segue very nicely to a policy question that has been front and center during the last eighteen months. And this is sort of our our last round of, of questions for everyone. Um, um, almost every statistic that measures um, such outcomes has found that underserved populations, particularly minorities uh, and women, are being negatively impacted much more significantly from COVID and the resulting economic crisis. Now, for all of you, um, how can we prioritize recovery and resilience for these populations? And what, if any, role do these digitization and digital financial services play in that. And Caitlin, I'm gonna begin with you. Yeah, that's um, great. Yes. Yeah, no, I think this is this this is this conversation spot on. The biggest trend we've seen hands down um, around the world um, is that women and diverse owned businesses were hardest hit. Um, by by the, the pandemic. And the good news is that they're recovering, but the recovery is happening more slowly than non-diverse businesses. Ramiro, you touched on this a bit. Um, you know, the Facebook Data Small Business Report was global. We surveyed 35,000 small businesses in 30 countries um, and the stats were consistent. And so, you know, a couple of numbers here to back up the, the great conversation, you know, 40% of diverse owned businesses reported challenges to cash flow as of this fall. And that's compared to 29% of the overall, you know, SMB group. 
Um, this has huge downstream impacts for small businesses. You know, we saw 32% of diverse owned businesses have reported reducing size in their workforce compared with 20% of overall SMBs. So these kinds of things are impacting the recovery speed for female and diverse owned businesses. I am so excited, you know, on the trends we're seeing in terms of new businesses that are owned um, by females and diverse populations. And so, I, you know, tech companies like Facebook are really leaning in to intentionally support that as well as the broader SMB, um, you know, transformation and uh, and recovery. So, you know, at Facebook, we're focused, Ramiro, on a lot of what you mentioned, which is like access, skills, and capital. You know, so it's not just leaning in to help around the product and service that we provide at Facebook um, in terms of advertising. So, you know, we have a program called Facebook Elevate, um, which is focused on Black and Hispanic SMBs. Um, the foundation of it is, is not just advertising, but mentoring, networking, and free training. Um, we want really doubling down on, on helping to close the skills gap. Um, so, you know, Facebook is, is funding 100,000 scholarships um, to, close, to close those gaps. And we're also looking at, you know, innovative ways to help SMBs um, and diverse owned SMBs, especially with cash flow, um, like buying outstanding invoices so that these, um, these SMBs can have more cash on hand to operate through these, you know, difficult months and, um, and you know, ride strong into the holiday period, which we mentioned earlier is going to be so critical. So I think, you know, the lesson for us is, you know, you really can't think about SMBs as a monolith um, and we need to continue to understand the ways in which organizations like ours are uniquely positioned to help comprehensively, you know, not just around our own product and service areas. Well, thank you, Caitlin, for all the work, the work at Facebook in helping SMBs through their pain points and also seeing the opportunities uh, in yeah. the marketplace. Thank you so yeah, much. It's so exciting. Yes, it is. Uh, Dr. Dr. Kachwar, you are you're next. <laughs> Great. Well, I think you know Caitlin has, has covered a lot of, of ground as as has everybody, but I think it's such an important question. And I think even, you know, there's a lot of optimism in the numbers and what we're seeing in the trends. Um, but I think that you know, several panelists have said we need to kind of counter that with the realism, looking at the trends for the next couple of months, um, and also looking at the, the impacts on these diverse populations. Um, we know that women and minority owned businesses have been hardest hit and these populations have been hardest hit throughout the pandemic as well and you know this is one of the reasons that some of for what some of what we've seen in the uptake in small businesses and I think the lesson here is that we really need to focus both on the small businesses that have arisen out of opportunity, those that have great ideas for how to use digitization to innovate and to better serve the emerging needs of the modern economy. But we also really need to think about how to help those that arose out of necessity, which can be just as innovative and which are also still, you know, really have the opportunity to form the backbone of a recovery in the same way as we saw in a previous crisis. And so it's really a moment to look at policies that can help these communities that have had such barriers put in their place um, that see an opportunity that have started businesses, um, how can we continue that? You know, the business sector is, is doing um, some part to help digitize businesses, for example. Um, you know, at Visa, we have some programs with Black Girl Ventures, for example. We have our Visa Everywhere initiative, um, and She's Next, where we mentor women-owned businesses. This is all important, um, but what's really important also is to make sure that the public sector and the private sector continue to work together just to make sure that these businesses can survive and thrive and help the economy recover. And conversations like this, Karen, and asking those questions are just so important. So thank you very much for that. Well, thank you, Dr. Kachwa. And you're right, there's so many people that started businesses out of necessity that have become regional and global brands, right? Mm -hmm. So, and and thanks to Visa for recognizing, uh, recognizing this and what we're seeing now in the growth of entrepreneurship and the support that you all provide uh, to um, entrepreneurs and small businesses everywhere. So, uh, and Liz, uh, you're gonna get to close out the panel here um, with your thoughts. 
Well, um, I know that our government departments that are not just our department of business, but our cabinet office, our treasury, they all have small business advisory panels and groups. And so they are listening to people on the ground who are running small businesses as well as representative organizations, et cetera. And I think that's really important. Um, but a million out of our six million businesses are ethnic minority led. Mm. And that, that creates 74 billion pounds a year for the economy and employs 10% of our workforce. So this is not a small number of businesses that we're talking about here. Um, so we need to make sure that access to all our procurement of our public sector spend, which Romero uh, pointed to earlier, and I think this is very important, we need to make sure that that is open to those businesses. Um, and many of those are women-led, and of course there are other businesses in addition that are women-led. We need to give those support. We need to open up the public sector, um, uh, what am I trying to say, contracts for women and ethnic minority-led businesses. Um, and the government has long had an aspiration to make sure that small businesses had about 30% of those contracts. And it's not, we've not quite got there yet. Uh, in fact, I think we have quite a long way to go because the procurement system is so complicated. So this is where the digitization comes in. If we can use good technical digital tools in order to make that procurement system much simpler for many of those small businesses, because the, the pushback is that we haven't got the time and resources. We haven't got the people. There's only, there's only three of us. We haven't got, one person cannot go out for three months in order to work on a procurement, a pitch for a contract. So we've got to make that much, much easier. And we've also got to, and I've been talking this afternoon uh, about this very issue. And I have been told that what we have to do is make sure that the major contractors uh, that are working on these government uh, contracts have those same principles and that same ethos that the government does, that they want to increase the number of those contracts that go to small businesses. But underlying all of this, what I am told is that cash is king. Uh, mm -hmm. Small businesses prefer not to have their invoices bought. They prefer to get the payments in on time. And constantly, I am told, just do your job, stick to your knitting, make sure we get those payments. And I don't think prompt is the right word. Um, I think quickly would be a much better word. We need to get those payments very quickly into the bank accounts of those small businesses once the work is done, because that's what will give the certainty. Uh, lack of certainty leads to mental health issues. It leads to stress and depression and anxiety, which leads to a drop in productivity. And we really, really need to make sure that the money is forthcoming as soon as the work is done so that we can get out there, the six million, almost six million small businesses and innovate and take those risks and create those jobs and help to drive the recovery. Well, thank you so much, Liz, for that, you know, very inspirational um, final words uh, from the panel. And, and thank you too for focusing on, we talked a lot about, you know, the private sector and small businesses being forced uh, on the digitization front, but there's a lot that government can do on this front as well that would make it um, a lot more, a lot easier for small businesses and their engagement with uh, with, the, with the government sector, particularly on the procurement front. So thank you for bringing that up as well. So let me just say, let me end by saying there is clearly a scope and space here for greater adoption of digital tools to help uh, enhance small business productivity and growth. And uh, this wonderful group of panelists has truly set the stage uh, for what comes next. Uh, these are cross industry, cross border conversations we need to continue to have to truly support entrepreneurial growth everywhere. And, um, and let me just thank all of you, our, our great panelists for taking the time to join the conversation today. So thank you all. Pleasure. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Be thank safe you. and take care.